Okay, so today we're going to conclude. This is part two of the intro to the appointed times of Yahweh. Okay, I believe we'll conclude it today. Uh, I want to start off with a quick review of what we learned in part one. So in part one, we talked about and understood that Yahweh has appointed times that we're to meet with him. These are his appointed times, and that these appointed times are for the children of Israel. So those are the two main important pieces of who put them in place and who they're for. Okay, so if you have gone through the Discovering Your Identity teaching, you should at this point realize you're supposed to be Israel. And so these are days and times that were set apart for you to interact with your Creator. Okay, that's first and foremost. Now, we also learned that these things called Moadim, these appointed times, that they have to do with the seasons, they have to do with festivals, they have to do with meeting together for a specific purpose, and that each one of these has connected to it what's called a Mikra Kodesh, or a set-apart gathering that's treated like a Shabbat. Okay, it's treated like a Shabbat. Okay, so we found out that there were five Moadim, or five seasons or periods of time, you have Pesach and Chag HaMatzot, you know, Passover and Unleavened Bread, which also included Bikarim, the waving of the Omer. Then we have Chag HaShavuot, or the Feast of Weeks. We have Zikron Trua, or Yom Trua, the Day of the Awakening Blast, or the Day of Trumpets. Yom HaKippurim, the Day of Atonements. And then Chag HaSukot, which included Shemini Atzeret, the Feast of Booths and the Eighth Day Assembly. So you had five Moedim, and then what we ended up also talking about was the seven high days or high Shabbats connected with the Moedim. There was the first day of Chag HaMatzot. There was the last day of Chag HaMatzot. There was Shavuot, Trumpets, Atonement, the first day of Sukkot, and the eighth day assembly. There's your seven, okay? Now, remember, this is a 101 class so that we can be encouraging people who have asked the question, what do I do? How do I keep them? When are they? So what you want to make sure for your employment situation is to make sure that you've gotten days off for those seven high days. Now, generally, at least one or two of them will fall on a Saturday. Sometimes we get two or three of them will fall on a Saturday. That makes things a little bit easier because you should already be taking off for Shabbat. So you want to make sure when the days are. Now, we do have a calendar on our website that not only tells you what's coming up, but there is a, a little quick a reference below that calendar that has, these are the seven high days. These are the days you need to have off from work. And so that'll help you when you have to let your bosses know in advance, your employers know in advance, you know, what days you need to have off. So then we understood that there was a, a kind of grouping together of these things into what's called the Shalosh Regalim, or the three pilgrimage feasts. And so those were Chag HaMatzot, Unleavened Bread, right? Chag HaShavuot, which we just had, the Feast of Weeks, and Chag HaSukot, the Feast of Booths. Okay, so we have, those are listed in Deuteronomy 16, 16. And we also learned that these things were to be observed in the place that Yahweh chooses to place his name. And we talked about how interesting it may be that he actually has chosen to place us in the dispersion so that it may be okay then to observe these things in the dispersion because he chose to put us here. And it was his choice, okay? And so as we go through these things now, I want to get into the part two. We're going to get into how are they to be observed. How are they to be observed? Okay, so for each of the Moedim, we know there's a Mikra Kodesh or set apart gathering. So that's the first thing we need to understand is that when we're dealing with the feast days, there's also going to be a high day connected to it. Now for Pesach, for Passover, there's a meal... Okay, so you know, people say, well, I don't know what to do. We get emails all the time. What do I do for Passover? What do I do for Shavuot? What do I do? So now we're going to talk about those things. So for Pesach, there's a meal, and we do have a teaching called Passover Q&A, which un goes into a great detail about explaining about Passover and unleavened bread. And what you find out in the Passover Q&A is that there are two distinctly different things connected to the Passover. There is the performing of the Passover, which is the actual taking of the lamb and slaughtering it and all that stuff, which we are not doing now, and we'll get into why in a minute. And then there's the eating of the meal, okay? And so with Passover, there's the meal, and also connected with the meal is the retelling of the story of the Exodus, Okay, the retelling of the story of the Exodus. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 6, 
and we're going to read in verse 20. Deuteronomy, Devarim, Deuteronomy 6, 20. When your son asks you in time to come, saying, what is the meaning of the witness and the laws and the right rulings which Yahweh or Elohim has commanded you, then you shall say to your son, we were slaves of Pharaoh in Mitzrayim, in Egypt, and Yahweh brought us out of Mitzrayim with a strong hand, and Yahweh sent signs and wonders, great and grievous, upon the Mitzrites, upon Pharaoh and upon all his household before our eyes. And he brought us out from there to bring us in to give us the land of which he swore to our fathers. And Yahweh commanded us to do all these laws to fear Yahweh your Elohim for our good always to keep us alive as it is today. And it is righteousness for us when we guard to do all this command before Yahweh our Elohim as he has commanded us. So you see, in that instruction there, the Jews by tradition have believed that it was as important that at a thing like Passover where a child may say, why are we doing all this? That it goes back to because of what he did for us when he brought us out of Mitzrayim, out of Egypt. Okay, so we have this retelling of the story. But notice also, just to, to kind of have in there, in verse 24 and 25, there's some really critical points that kind of go against what you hear in mainstream Christianity these days, which is, number one, that these laws and fearing Yahweh or Elohim are for our good always. So that means they cannot be looked at as, oh, that awful, burdensome law. No, they're for your good always. And not only are they for your good always, but they are to keep us alive. Interesting, as it is today. So they are for the purpose of keeping us alive. So let's make sure that we understand that. And then it says, and if we do these things, it is righteousness for us. So that also kind of goes a little bit against, if not a lot against, the idea that somehow Yeshua did it all for you, so it's only his righteousness that you need. Now, you do need his, but this is the righteousness that we need also that we have to do. He says, and it is righteousness for us when we guard to do all this, all that Yahweh has commanded. Very important. Okay, so for Passover, there's a meal and a retelling of the story. Now, there's no blood on the doorposts and no offering of a lamb. Okay, there's no blood on the doorposts at offering. The blood on the doorposts historically was done once. Just once. I know there are people still today that are putting blood on their doorposts. Stop doing that. Not scriptural. Not the way the instruction is. That was the one time event. What we find out is in Deuteronomy 16, also in verse 5, let's go there, is that you aren't to sacrifice a lamb for it either. Because there are people that are doing that in their backyard. That's not to say you can't eat lamb at the Passover. As a matter of fact, I think you should have some lamb as a reminder about the symbols. But we're not doing the ritual of selecting out the lamb on, on the 10th day and saving it till the 14th day and then slaughtering it between the evenings as an offering, the Passover offering. We're not doing that. Why? Let's look at Deuteronomy 16 and in verse 5. You are not allowed to slaughter the Passover within any of your gates, which Yahweh your Elohim gives you. Um, is that ambiguous to anybody? I mean, he actually comes right out and says, you are not allowed to slaughter the Passover within any of your gates. So you can't do this in your backyard. He says, but at the place where Yahweh your Elohim chooses to make his name dwell, there you slaughter the Passover in the evening at the going down of the sun at the appointed time you came out of Mitzrayim. Now, he chose for that event to be done by the priests, to be done in Jerusalem. And there's so many verses that cover all of this. And he makes it very clear in other verses and other places, you are not to just make offerings anywhere you want. He has a place to make those. There are things that you can do when you're not in the land, but there's some things that require the temple and the Levites, etc. So we're not doing Passover offerings of the lamb. If you want to eat some during the meal, I think that's wonderful because it's a symbol to remind you of what they used to do. But we need not be and should not be because he says don't. You are not allowed. It's pretty straightforward. Don't do this. And yet I know that I get conversations going on on a regular basis with people who are all upset because their congregation is having a major rift and split because half the people in it want to do this lamb sacrifice thing. 
and they're putting blood on their doorposts. That'll work real well in your neighborhood homeowners association thing, right? And, the, and you'll say to them, well, it doesn't say anything about blood on the doorpost. It just says that I have to have my lawn a certain way. <laughs> yes, I think we might have to amend that. I'm not going to be happy with you doing that. Numbers chapter 9. Okay, Numbers chapter 9. I'm not going to read this whole section here, but in, in Bimidbar, Numbers chapter 9, what we read about here in chapter 9 is the second Passover instructions. Okay, so now they're in the wilderness. Okay, and they're being instructed about the second Passover. In verse, uh, let's see, we'll read verse 1 and 2 here just to get a sense of it. And Yahweh spoke to Moshe in the wilderness of Sinai in the first of the second month of the year. After they had come out of the land of Mitzrayim, he said, Now let the children of Israel perform the Passover at its appointed time. On the 14th day of this month, between the evenings, perform it at its appointed time according to its laws. Right, rulings to perform it. Okay, so this is for those who were not able to partake of the first one. So we're getting something that's being put in here. Now notice what he's saying here. So they performed the Passover on the 14th day of the first month. That's the regular one, right? Between the evenings. Now they're in, I'm sorry, I'm confusing this just a little bit. Let me go back to verse, okay, this is the second year. This is the regular Passover second year, not second Passover. My senior moment for me, I guess, early on. Okay, second year Passover in the wilderness. So it's the Proper Passover. They're in the wilderness now. Notice what he says. He says on the 14th day of the month, between the evenings, you're going to perform the Passover at the point of times, according to all its laws, right rulings, and perform it. And then as they go through all these instructions, you know what you're going to find? There's no mention of doorposts and blood because they didn't have any. They were intense. Nobody put blood on anything. They, you know why? What was the point of the blood on the doorposts? to be assigned to the angel, the messenger that came, not to take the firstborn. Was there any risk to the firstborn after that first Passover? No. That event was a one-time event. Okay? So here you have your instructions for the Passover year two. Okay, this is the Passover year two, not the second Passover. The year two messed me up in my head real quick. Okay? Sometimes the words come out faster than the thoughts get coalesced in the brain. But in year two, we don't see them putting blood on the doorposts because there are no doorposts and because it was a one-time event. We do see them doing the lamb. Why? There were priests. There was a tabernacle. They built a tabernacle. They had that to, do, to work with. And so there was a way to do that process. His name was dwelling with them. The tent of meeting was going around. And so that's important that we understand. So for Passover, for you to understand that is that we have a meal and a retelling of the story. Okay? The other piece to this, which I didn't put in my notes and I should have, is that it is a covenantal meal for circumcised members only. If you have a problem with that, which I'm sure a lot of you on live stream are now going, ah, the, oh, this whole circumcision thing. You got to listen to the teaching that we have on these things, the Passover Q&A, where it goes through all of this in detail. Okay? And I think that's a covered on part one of the teaching. It's two-part teaching. Okay, now, for Chag HaMatzot, okay, so first we covered Passover, now we're up to Chag HaMatzot. Chag HaMatzot, what do we do for unleavened bread? We get the leaven out of the house, and we eat unleavened bread. Okay, that's the functional part of it. For the week, for the seven days, you have no leaven in your house, and you actually go out, make an effort to eat unleavened bread. Okay, you're supposed to actually not only get leaven out, but you actually are to eat of the unleavened bread. Fachag HaShavuot, what do we do for Shavuot? Well, we do have obviously the Mikra Kodesh, we get together, but we also have a counting of the 50 days. Okay, we have a counting of the 50 days. So we count from the wave sheaf day all the way to the 50th day, and that's when Shavuot is. So we have this, this, re, uh, this ritual or this uh, tradition of every day acknowledging this is day three, this is day four, this is day five, okay, as we count towards the 50 days. Then for Yom Truah, okay, for the Yom Truah or Zikron Truah, the sounding of the shofar is done. Okay, so we have this, the shofar is a part of that service. We sound the shofar for Yom Truah. For Yom HaKippurim or Yom Kippur, we afflict ourselves by fasting. Okay, so there's a fasting in there. I know a lot of you are going to make arguments about what the word literally means and how they came up with this stuff. Let's not have that debate right this second, okay? 
It's, it's, it's a day that we afflict ourselves by fasting. And then for Chag HaSukot, we dwell in booths for eight days. And so now it's not necessarily required that you yourself, now that we're in the dispersion, go ahead and build a booth to go ahead and live in. Now you can go ahead and stay in a temple, but it's a temporary dwelling. But there are people that would come to Jerusalem and they would stay on people's roofs. That's why you had a law about putting a fence around your roof. So you'd have people staying on top of a roof of a house. You'd have people that stayed in what was basically a tent city outside of Jerusalem. They'd have this huge area that was like a tent city. And they would have people that would stay in the various inns. There were places that people would stay, but it was a temporary dwelling. It wasn't where you normally live. Okay? So we live in temporary dwellings. And then for Shemini Atzeret, which is included in all of this, okay, that is just so we understand what it symbolizes. It expresses our desire to stay in Yah's house for one more day. You know, it's almost like the guests are at the party saying, hey, we're just loving this so much. Can we just stay one more day? And that's kind of the way people have looked at it through the centuries, uh, Shemini Atzeret, the eighth day assembly. Okay? Now, so that is your Moedim, but there's one more element that we attach now to the Shalosh Regalim. The Shalosh Regalim, the three pilgrimage feasts, Deuteronomy 16 and in verse 16. Okay, Deuteronomy 16, 16, where it says, Three times a year all your males appear before Yahweh your Elohim in the place he chooses at the festival of unleavened bread, at the festival of weeks, and at the festival of booths. And none should appear before Yahweh empty-handed. But each one with the gift of his hand according to the blessing of Yahweh your Elohim which he has given you. So for the Shalosh Regalim, we are instructed to make an offering. We're instructed to make an offering based on what? According to the blessing of Yahweh your Elohim which he has given you. So Yahweh wants to look at your life from one of the Shalosh Regalim to the next, from one of the Chagim to the next. And look at the blessing you've received and then make an appropriate offering based on that. <coughs> now I'll say this. That's going to be a little tough if you haven't been thinking about it all the way along. And what do I mean by that? Let's say we just had Shavuot and we don't have the next feast until September. And what if something amazing he does for you next week? Are you going to have something put aside to give him in September? What you should do is put it aside when it happens. He does something wonderful in your life. You feel very blessed. Put something aside. Have that to bring in September when you don't come empty-handed. Okay, or October. This year, I guess, Sukkot is October. Okay, so you don't come empty-handed. I would go ahead and start putting aside for something. He does blessings and miracles in your life. Appreciate that. Put something aside. So you have something to bring. Prepare for these things. See, he's telling you in advance. What does that mean? It means that we should then be preparing for these things. So you don't just show up all of a sudden at one of the Shalosh Regalim and you go, start reaching into your pocket and go and wonder, okay, I don't know if I have anything to put. I, I only didn't bring much. Well, what about preparing for it so that you can show him how much you appreciate what he's done for you? Okay? Prepare for these things. By the way, not just financially, but you should be preparing to have the leaven out of your house and eat unleavened bread. So you don't sit around going, but the stores didn't have any matzah. Well, because you waited too long. You got to prepare. Don't let these things sneak up on you. Okay, we didn't talk about this in the teaching yet, but I'm going to talk about it, I guess, in this space, even though it's not in my notes. You know, a lot of us have become fairly Shabbat-centric. In other words, we're good at knowing Sabbath is coming. It doesn't sneak up on you too much. Too much. Sometimes it may sneak up on you, but for the most part, you're not surprised like, oh my, it's already Friday, okay? You plan and know Shabbat is coming. But what you've not necessarily done is become what I call Chag-centric, okay? Having the Chagim be something you center your thoughts and your life around so that they also don't surprise you. Because I get people all the time telling me, oh, it's Sukkot already? Oh, I don't have enough money to go, and I wasn't planning. You, you aren't Chag-centric. You should never be taken by surprise by a feast showing up. As a matter of fact, you should be anticipating with excitement the feast coming. I mean, we just finished one. The, you should be all about focusing now and excited about trumpets coming. That's your next one. 
and thinking about the transition, and we're going to talk about what you're supposed to be learning through these feasts for that next piece, but you should not be surprised by these things. Your life should be centered around them as far as your timing of your calendar and knowing what's planning your life around. Look, I know some of you plan your life about tr around trips to visit friends and family, you know, especially like for me, I've got children with grandparents in two different states. I've got a plan to go see them so the children and the grandparents see each other. I've got to make sure that's on my calendar. But I've got to make sure before that's on my calendar that the feasts are on my calendar. The thing that goes on your calendar first are your dates and appointments with the king. So you need to have your calendar out because I get people all the time contacting me, when's the next feast? What do you mean when's the next feast? You guys should have your calendar for the whole year already laid out. You should know when the next feast is. Now, we do have them on our website. You can look them up. But once we started the year with Passover, you should know all of them for the whole year. You should know exactly when they're coming. It should be on your calendar. You should have all your days off worked out, etc. I mean, he, he didn't just, like, tell you this stuff so that you would just, like, forget about it until somebody would wake you up and remind you but to plan your life around them. That's the important part of this. Okay, so why? why? Why are we doing these things? The Moedim are an annual cycle of rehearsals that teach us Yahweh's plan of salvation. They actually are instructional. They are meant to serve as weekly, monthly, and yearly reminders of our identity and purpose and to be guideposts of where we are within Yahweh's plan. That's why he gave these to us. In the spring, okay, because the Moedim are seasonal events. They happen in seasons and are broken up into the spring and the fall. And so in the spring, we have Passover, Chag HaMatzot and Chag HaShavuot. Okay, so we have those things in the spring. And then in the fall, we have Yom Truah, Yom HaKippurim, and Chag HaSukot and Shemini Atzeret. So we have the spring feasts and the fall feasts. Now, each of the feasts helps to give us understanding of Yahweh's plan of salvation for his people. Let's go to Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. I know everybody got excited or nervous. He's going to Colossians 2. Oh. <coughs> Excuse me. Colossians chapter 2, verse 16. Let no one therefore judge you in eating or drinking or in respect of festival or new moon or Sabbaths, which are a shadow of what is to come, but the body of the Messiah. Okay, so who's the audience here? Is the audience Gentiles? Look at verse 1 or verse 2 of chapter 1. Shaul, an emissary in chapter verse 2 says, to the set apart ones in, in Colossae. The set-apart ones and the true brothers and Messiah. So these are people who are probably doing what? And I don't, shouldn't even say probably. They're keeping the commandments. They're observing the commandments. But they are probably people that didn't necessarily keep them their whole life. So they probably have a lot of friends and family members. I know you find this shocking, but these guys had family members giving them grief about what they were doing. I know none of you have that problem, Okay. So what it says here is not what Christianity says, because Christianity takes it the other way around. He says, Christianity is saying, don't let the Jews judge you because you're keeping different days and eating things that they don't eat. That's what they're saying it says. No, it's the opposite. He says, don't let the Gentiles pick on you because you're no longer doing their stuff because you're eating differently and observing different days. He says, let no one therefore judge you in eating or drinking, because now you're no longer eating. Because remember, they ate and drank everything. So why would it be an issue for them? But you've now chosen to eat and drink differently. He says, or in respect to the festivals, the new moons, and the Sabbaths, because these are a shadow of what is to come. A shadow. Okay, so Christianity I've seen and I've heard teach that shadow makes it somehow, it's an insignificant thing. It's just something that was, oh, that's nothing. Well, in a sense, they're right, but really what it is, it's a reflection in a small way of the real. So the shadow is just a small taste of what the real thing is. So like if you saw me standing, you may not even know it's me if you only saw my shadow. You might know that it's a person of a certain size or height or whatever, depending on how the sun and the angle is, but the shadow, but you really don't get any detail 
per se, of what the whole thing's all about. You just might see a person, okay? If I had a hat on, you might see the shadow that I had a hat on. So now you know it's a person with a hat. But you don't really know much more. What here is saying is that the shadow is pointing to what is to come. So Sabbaths are coming. Feasts are pointing to things that are coming. It's all about the plan of salvation. But then there is this, this sort of parenthetical thing that says, but the body of the Messiah. So what it's trying to say is that, look, let no one judge you but the body. Because the body is the only one qualified to do any judging of those that are keeping. And within the body, everybody doesn't get to judge. There are people appointed to those positions. So he's saying, look, stop letting people judge you that are not in the body. <laughs> They don't understand that what you're doing is a shadow of what's coming. You know what's coming? We read this already. It said last week when we talked about if everybody doesn't come up and keep the Feast of Tabernacles and doesn't keep Sukkot, they're going to get plagues. So right now it's just a shadow. It's going to be much bigger later. And we know that from one new moon to another and from one Shabbat to another, people are going to come and worship. So the, sh- the Sabbath and the feasts are all incredibly important and serious things in the future. But right now we're rehearsing them, we're practicing them, we're dealing with the shadow pictures of them. And so hopefully we understand that in, in, in this verses here. Now listen in the verse, this is going to read the part A, beginning of verse 18. He says, let no one deprive you of the prize, let no one deprive you of the prize, one who takes delight in false humility and worship of messengers. Okay, we can skip that part. But he says, look, He says, don't let anybody steal your prize. How are they going to steal your prize? Because you give in to their judging you and you like get all nervous that they're picking on you and you get all embarrassed that you're not like everybody else anymore and so you give in and you change back to be like them. Listen to the flow here. Let no one judge you in respect to these things which are a shadow of what's to come except the body of Messiah because if you do, someone may steal your prize. You'll be deprived of your prize. If you give in... And let others judge you, you may give up your prize. And by the way, if you're a Jew, the Torah is their most prized possession. And so you can even add in here, if you're going to let these people talk you out of the Torah, they're taking the greatest prize. Because that's the thing that will help change you into Yeshua. It's a highly valued thing. It's the vehicle It's the means to transformation from what you are into what he is. Very important. Okay, so let's look at Yahweh's plan of salvation as expressed through the feasts. So I'm going to review the Moedim and give you their historical fulfillment, their messianic fulfillment, and their spiritual application. So each of these feasts actually happened already. In other words, the event that it's commemorating has already happened. So they have a historical thing that they point to. But they also have a messianic fulfillment. Yeshua has fulfilled already the spring feast. We're going to go through that. He has not yet fulfilled the fall feasts. There's also a spiritual application in walking these things out that goes through that whole plan of salvation, that transformative process that leads eventually to salvation. So let's, let's go through this. So we're going to look at the historical application. Historically, they've all been fulfilled. Messianically, only the spring feasts have been fulfilled, and we're still awaiting the messianic fulfillment of the fall Moedim. So first of all, there's the Shabbat. That's the first of the feasts we read in Leviticus 23. And then what is the Shabbat is about? Shabbat is about rest. But we're also told that we're looking towards his rest, to being in the Shabbat. There's a Shabbat, a Shabbat rest for his people. When we're going to rest from all cares, that's going to go forward into the millennium and into the kingdom, the true Shabbat. You know, the Shabbat was set apart at creation. Okay, so that's your historical event, right? It was set apart at creation as Kadosh time, set apart time. Time that was set apart for the purpose of serving Yahweh. In other words, that time is not for just sleeping all day. That time is not for going and doing a hobby and whatever you like to do. It's for serving Yahweh's purposes, spending time with him, focused on him, studying about him, learning about him. It's all about him. The least we can do is give him one day out of seven. We should be giving him much more. Okay, and it's a day of rest. And by rest, it's not a rest like, like I said, where you just do nothing. It's a rest from your work to produce. 
I don't know how many of you have felt this way, but I feel this way almost every week, if not every week. I feel refreshed after spending a day with all of you. I may have been tired after a long week, because I've had people tell me, oh, I guess I'm just going to Shabbat at home. I'm, I, you know, it's, I've worked hard all week, and I'm just too tired. Really? Too tired to come? Listen, if Yeshua was coming this week, I know some of you would get up if there was just a guest speaker you liked that was coming. You'd make sure to be there. All of you people are here, though. Why would you be here for us? Don't you want to spend time with us? You'd rather just, oh, I'm tired. I'd rather just stay home. All of us are tired. We come here to be refreshed. That's the whole point. You know, this is a special Moad because it is observed on a weekly basis. We also know the verses talking about Yeshua being the Lord or Master of the Sabbath. So it's a very significant connection to Yeshua there, messianically. The Shabbat provides a weekly look back to creation and a look forward to the kingdom and our rest in Mashiach. Okay, next we have Passover. So Pesach, which represents redemption, salvation, deliverance, and freedom. The historical fulfillment was in Exodus 11 and 12 when the children of Israel trusted in Yahweh's promise of protection from death through the shed blood of the Lamb. The messianic fulfillment was Yeshua's death on the tree as the Lamb of Elohim. The spiritual application is our trust in the promise of redemption and reconciliation through the shed blood of Yeshua, the Lamb of Elohim, who died once for all. See, so it's a powerful metaphor. We start off the journey learning about the fact that we need to be redeemed and reconciled. That's part of the plan of salvation. You don't get to start on the path until you realize you need redemption and reconciliation. And then you come on this path, and it starts off with this thing called the Passover. Then we go into Chag HaMatzot. The historical fulfillment was the children of Israel going out from Egypt, out from its Ryan, out of bondage. So messianically, this was fulfilled by Yeshua's victory over sin and death through his death, burial, and resurrection. The spiritual application is our burying the old man and coming out from sin. See, that was the symbol. They, they actually physically got up and left. Some of you listening still need to get up and leave your churches. Some of you need to get up and leave the friends that you are, have that have you in a very worldly place. Some of this stuff you're going to have to get up and leave. You may have to leave family members. You may have to, who knows what you may have to leave? I don't know what you're dealing with. Whatever part of it is Egypt, you need to get up and get out. That's the symbolism here. The bearing the old man and the coming out of sin. Let's look at Romans uh, chapter 6 and verse 1. Romans 6 <clears throat> and verse 1. What then shall we say? Shall we continue in sin to let favor increase? Let it not be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Are we listening? If you've died to sin, why are you still living in it? Get up and leave. Flee from that stuff. Or do you not know that as many of us were immersed into Messiah Yeshua, were immersed into his death? See, there's the connection. We were therefore buried with him through the immersion into death, that as Messiah was raised from the dead by the esteem of the Father, so also we should walk in newness of life. For if we have come to be grown together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also of the resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was impaled with him, <clears throat> so that the body of sin might be rendered powerless to serve sin no longer. You want to know what was nailed with him? It says it right there. It wasn't the Torah. There it is. It says, we, listen now, it says, we were impaled with him. What was impaled with him? Our old man. Our old, sinful, worldly old man was nailed to the stake. Not the Torah. It says, we were nailed, the, so that why? So that the body of sin might be rendered powerless. Oh, but Christianity says it's rendered powerless because we did away with it. So now there's no more sin. It's ridiculous. I mean, that's completely absurd. He says here, so that we serve sin no longer. Ah, so doing and serving sin. So he says, you're supposed to now come out of her, my people. You're supposed to come out of Egypt, come out of Babylon, come out of your old worldly, old man life, and walk now in newness of life. 
And that's part of what unleavened bread is talking about. It's talking about that whole picture there. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 4. I think I want to hit this a little harder. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 4. And we'll begin in verse 17. So this I say and witness in the master that you should no longer walk as the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, having been darkened in their understanding, having been estranged from the life of Elohim because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart. That's what you're leaving behind. Just like what you were reading in Romans, now we're having a little bit more details here. He says, look, your old man was living and walking in futility. What kind of futility? The futility of doing it your way. Hopefully at some point, your light bulb will go on and you'll realize that your way is futile. If that hasn't happened yet, I pray it happens soon. You will be a happier person when you get there. But the thing is, they walk in the futility of their mind, having been darkened in their understanding and their, because of their ignorance. In their ignorance, they're seeking that which they like and is familiar to them instead of seeking the truth, whatever it is. In their ignorance, this is happening. Continue, verse 19, he says, who having become callous, have given themselves up to indecency, to work all uncleanness with greediness, but you have not so learned Messiah. Interesting. So Messiah is connected to behavior. That's Torah. See, you've not learned Messiah. You've not learned the truth. You've not learned the word. You've not learned the Torah. You've not learned life that way. You've learned it differently. See, the, when you see the word Messiah, you should be able to interchange or amplify. I'm not a big fan of the Amplified Bible, but you need to amplify some things. Okay, when you see Messiah, Yeshua, truth, Torah, word, life, light, they're all the same thing. So when you see one, think of all of them. So he says here, but you indeed did not learn the truth that way. You have not learned, you've not so learned the word. You've not so learned the Torah. You've not so learned the way. You've not so learned life. Interesting. <clears throat> he says, if indeed you have heard him and were taught by him as truth, is in Messiah, as the Word is in Messiah, as the Torah is in Messiah. So just fill in that. Life is in Messiah. Light is in Messiah. In Yeshua. That you put off with regard to your former way of life, the old man, being corrupted according to the desires of deceit, and to be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the renewed man, which was created according to Elohim in righteousness, that's in other words, right behavior, and set apartness of the truth, the Torah, Yeshua, the Word, etc. Now notice this, he says here, you need to put off the old man. You need to put off the former way of life. This is not something he does for you, where you know, oh, I made an altar call, it's all good now. No, you need to actively participate in putting off the old man putting off the former behaviors and lifestyles and thought processes that all got you and all that kind of mess you were in. Because if you don't, you're going to stay in the mess. He says, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind that you then put on. Now you actually have to actively, listen now, he doesn't say he will give it to you. You now need to put on the new renewed man. You need to put on the renewed man which was created according to Elohim. Therefore, having put off the false, speak truth, each one of his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Interesting. This is the picture of Chag HaMatzot, right? The coming out. What did they do? They came out of Egypt, and what was one of the first things they did? They went through a mikvah. They went through the parting of the sea, which is a symbol of starting fresh and being washed clean. Interesting. Let's go to Colossians chapter 1 and verse 13. Just one verse here. Who delivered us from the authority of darkness and transferred us into the reign of the Son, uh, the son of His love. Okay, that's in Colossians 1.13. We were delivered, listen, just like in, in Moses' day coming out of Egypt, He delivered us from the authority of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom or the reign of His Son. That's the symbolism here of Chag 
Hopefully we can all start to see that. So the plan of salvation is starting to come through. First we realize we need to be redeemed and reconciled. Then we understand part of the process, really a critical part of the process, is to stop doing all the things that got us separated from him in the first place. Why would you need redemption and reconciliation? You know, if you and I were married, if I was married to one of you and we had a problem and a split, trying to bring us back together is called reconciling. And what do you do when you reconcile? You have to deal with all the issues that caused you to be separated. You have to reconcile what's an issue. So you know what the issue was? You were walking according to the estrangement in your own, the futility of your mind. Okay, we have to stop walking in the futility of our own minds and being darkened in our understanding and being in ignorance. That's why we were estranged. Okay, so the last of the spring feasts is Chag HaShavuot. So the next step, historically this was fulfilled when they, get, they received the Torah at Mount Sinai. Messianically, the fulfillment was the pouring out of the Ruach in Acts chapter 2. And the spiritual application is our receiving of the Ruach HaKodesh and having the Torah written on our hearts. So what do you see happening now? They were re- went through redemption, reconciliation, understanding, started the process of coming out of her, my people. This is for you too, right? You're starting to let go of the old way, the old life, putting on the new renewed man. Then you show up at Shavuot, and now you're in a cleaned, fresh, like a clean slate, ready for him to write his Torah on. So now you come to Shavuot, and now he's going to give you and instruct you and write on you what he expects of you, so you can figure out and understand and discern what is well-pleasing in his sight. But you have to stop the futility of your own mind. you got to stop your own way of thinking, your own way, oh, but I like, but oh, well, I always was taught this. Well, but maybe what you always taught was wrong. Stop filtering everything through everything that you already have an experience with. Let everything go. That's what he asked them to do when they came out of Egypt. Let everything go. Come to Sinai and let me write from scratch on you. Let me, let me fresh start. Okay? So then we get to the fall feasts. And so with the coming of the fall comes the final series of festivals. In rabbinic thinking, these festivals are known as the season of Teshuvah, the season of repentance and of our returning to Yahweh. Okay, so let's face it. You realize you need redemption, Passover, and reconciliation. You start to let go of things through the walk of unleavened bread. You get and journey eventually through the counting of the Omer, through that time period of, of coming out of my people. You get to a place where he starts to write it on your hearts. But then we now need to get to a place where we're actually Shema. We're hearing and doing. We're not just learning. See, we're just learning at, at Shavuot. We're being instructed at Shavuot. We're not actually necessarily doing everything yet. We're just finding out what it is we need to do or what we need not to do. So then we get to trumpets. Yom Teruah, the day of the awakening blast. The historical fulfillment was Yahweh speaking directly to the people of Israel at Mount Sinai. Okay, so that's the historical fulfillment, right? That was an awakening blast, right? There was thunderings, there was lightnings, and the blast of his voice, they heard that. Okay, it was a wake-up call. See, this is all about an awakening. Okay, trumpets is where the light bulb fully goes on and you say, I get it, I need to do this stuff. So the messianic fulfillment will be the sounding of the trumpets of Revelation 8 through 11, the resurrection of the dead and the return of Yeshua. See, now you're actually hearing, you're shemaying. And then the spiritual application is the hearing, the Shema, the calling of the shofar, the voice of Yahweh in our lives. That's trumpets. But are you, you know, are you ready to hear? He wants to talk to you. Are you ready to hear? And I don't mean literally like hearing his voice. I mean, the, like we did in the teaching, do you know the Father and the Son, the four or five parts from like part six to seven or eight or ten or whatever it was, that was, uh, my sheep know my voice. Do you understand what it is to hear his voice? So then we get to Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. That word can be broken up to at one minute. Remember, the whole thing started with Passover, which is when you realize you needed to be reconciled, to be at one, to be reconciled and redeemed. And then we get to Yom Kippur, which is the Day of at one minute, where we have forgiveness and reconciliation. The historical fulfillment was the Kohen Hagadol, the high priest, entering into the Holy of Holies. 
and the rituals of cleansing the people of Israel of their sins. Now, it wasn't the cleansing of sins that is the effect that we have from the death, burial, and resurrection of Yeshua, but it was something that they were told to do for the annual national forgiveness of sins. Not individual sin, but as a nation. It was the once a year national forgiveness of sins. The messianic fulfillment will be Yeshua's return. So now remember, these things have not happened yet, right? We have the return of Yeshua for trumpets. That hasn't happened yet. For atonement, we have the fulfillment being Yeshua's return and restoring the kingdom of Elohim, the returning of the children of Israel to the land. So it's the bringing it all back to at one. There will be one king. See, when he first returns, there's going to be a blast. And a lot of people are going to be like, ooh, we had that wrong. It's going to be a wake-up call. But then after that comes the reconciliation, the bringing everybody back together. After that war is over, after that battle's over. And so the spiritual application is to, is to uh, the Hebrew word we call teshuvah. And our embracing of the fullness that is Yeshua. What is teshuvah? Teshuvah means to turn around and get back on the path. To return to the path. Returning to Torah and restoring Yahweh's authority in our lives so we may be at one with him. That's the spiritual application here. So we're getting reconciled and redeemed to some... Well, we, I shouldn't say that. In Passover, we realize the need for reconciliation and redemption. Reconciliation actually takes place here at atonement as we started going through the process. Because while you're still wallowing in it, you can't reconcile. You're going to have to learn what it is to do different, let go of the old stuff, start walking it out, hear his voice, embrace his voice, shema, now we have reconciliation. Okay? Very important. Okay, then we get to Sukkot. Chag HaSukkot. The millennium. This symbol symbolizes worship and praise, redemption and thanksgiving, celebrating the harvest of righteousness in our lives and the harvest to come. The historical fulfillment was the Israelites dwelling in booths in the wilderness and their learning to be a nation. See, the Sukkot not only was about dwelling in booths, but them starting to learn to live as a nation unto Yahweh. Not just any nation, but a nation. Because remember, they used to be slaves of a nation, and now they are actually a nation unto themselves. Okay? The messianic fulfillment will be the millennium reign of Yeshua as king of kings and the whole world becoming one nation under Yah. The messianic fulfillment will be the millennial reign of Yeshua as king of kings and the whole world becoming one nation under Yah. So that hasn't happened yet. So we see him ruling for that thousand years. So the Sukkot represents that thousand years. The spiritual application is that we are, we, 1 Corinthians, we are the tabernacle. We are the booths of the living Elohim through the Ruach HaKodesh that is in us. And we are to be building our booth by following the pattern of Yeshua exactly. And that's why we have that teaching called follow the pattern exactly, which comes from Exodus 25, 9, where it says, and you shall build a tabernacle and do it exactly according to the pattern I showed you on the mountain. 1 Corinthians 6, 19, I believe, uh, says, Don't, do you not know that you are the tabernacle? Okay, let me just make sure I'm giving you the right verse there. One more page. Yeah, okay, 619. Or do you not know that your body is the dwelling place of the set-apart spirit who is in you? And you are not your own? Ah, that's a distinction that through all of this feast observance, you should have figured out way back towards the beginning of it, that you are not your own. That was understanding the need for redemption. You're not your own. You were bought with a price. Okay, that's verse 20 of uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 19. And then 20 says, for you were bought with a price. You're bought and paid for. Embrace fully what that means and how wonderful that is actually. Okay? The spiritual application, again, is that we are booths of Elohim through the Ruach HaKodesh that is in us, and we are to build our booth following the pattern of Yeshua exactly. We do this by becoming trustworthy, obedient children, submissive to Torah, who rejoice in our love for Yahweh. That's how we do this. We become trustworthy, obedient children, submissive to Torah, who rejoice in our love for Yahweh. And that brings us to the last one. 
Shemini Atzeret. The forever kingdom. The kingdom that comes, the kingdom now finally comes into its fullness. Historically, this was fulfilled when the Israelites entered into the promised land. They crossed the Jordan and entered into the promised land. The messianic fulfillment will be Revelation 21, the new heaven and the new earth and Elohim making his booth with men. The spiritual application is our being changed from corruptible to the incorruptible. When we're transformed into that, into that change. By keeping the Moedim, the appointed times of Elohim each year, we are reminded of their historical and messianic fulfillments and we look forward to keeping them with Yeshua when he returns. Amen? Amen. So let's understand as we go through this, that he lays it all out for us very simply, not very complicated. There are five Moedim seasonal periods, seven high days, three re Shalosh Regalim, three Chagim periods, right? The three times a year that we go and feast together. And, and, and the, the whole point of all of this is so that we never forget what happened historically, so that we never lack the appreciation for Yeshua's fulfilling of what he's already fulfilled and what he's coming back to do more and that we don't miss even one piece of how this is about you walking through the plan. So as we go now from Shavuot towards trumpets, you should be understanding that you're going from being informed about what he expects to really shamaying what he expects. You see? That's this period of time where you're now taking what you learned and playing with it and, str and struggling with it and messing with it and try trying to embrace it the right way so that by the time you finally get to trumpets, you're Shema, hearing and doing. Because you're not just going to pick it up at Shavuot, at Sinai, at the Acts 2 experience. You're not just going to pick it up instantly and be a changed, renewed, changed person. A whole new, whole new deal. You're going to have to start to make adjustments and changes. And some of you have made lots of them, and that's great. There are some things you still won't do. There's still some changes that you won't let, you know, things you won't let go of or things that you just won't embrace. Well, I just don't see, and that doesn't make sense to me, and I don't know why we have to blah, 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 blah. Stop that. <laughs> That's back to where it says the futility of your own mind. I mean, is that what you want to do? Walk like the Gentiles? Gentiles being everybody that's not in the camp. So don't take it as an insulting term, okay? The everybody else's. And by the way, we hope and pray that they all come in. But as long as they're out there, they're walking in the futility of their own minds. He's telling you to stop doing that. And so be Chag-centric. Know what's coming next. But not just know what's coming next so you have it on your calendar. <coughs> Excuse me. But know what's coming next and knowing this is the part of the plan I'm supposed to be walking out right now. And by the way, each year when you go through it, let's say you've been doing this for 20 years. It doesn't matter. You get to Passover, you remember that I need reconciliation. There's still stuff about what I'm doing that needs reconciling. I need redemption because I sin all the time still, and so all the time I'm going to need to be reconciled. i got to fix that. Then you go through unleavened bread and you start looking for the leaven in your life. You start looking for the hypocrisy. We have the teaching series that's going to start posting this week coming up on Get Out the Leaven, okay? So we have all of that coming. And so we're working on ourselves, trying to figure out what's wrong in there. And then we get to Shavuot, where we are able to sit now and embrace and listen and say, teach me your ways. Yeah, teach me your ways. But then, just because he teaches us doesn't mean that we're now going to be able to start doing it immediately, all of it, so that we have this period of time. And that's why there's a nice gap there, I think, between Shavuot and trumpets. There's that time it takes to be ready to fully Shema when we get to trumpets. And to atone and be ready for the full reconciliation of atonement. And to be ready to dwell together as a nation in the millennial setting of Sukkot. And then to be ready for forever. Because I've taught... And you know this, that Passover and unleavened bread and, the, the, in other words, the shalosh, shalosh, um, shalosh regalim are rehearsals for the forever kingdom where you practice living together as a group under one roof, so to speak, and you meet together and you eat together because that's how we practice what it's like. And if you can't prefer to be with each other, 
You're not ready for the forever kingdom because I expect all of you to be there. And if you don't enjoy each other's company now, why do you think you'll do then? <laughs> oh, well, because by then he'll have worked all that stuff out of her or out of him. Um, you got a mirror? Okay. We should prefer each other's company now. And he gives us these times where we don't have anything else to do but be together now. You know, I've had people leave services early. By early, I mean services, let's say, ends, well, now it ends about 4.30 for us. But we used to have services at 10 in the morning in Knoxville that would end about 1.30, whatever. And they would just be off. And I'm like, where are you going? It's Shabbat for another five, six hours. Why would you have any place you'd rather be than here with everybody else? Now, I know some of you on the live stream, obviously you're on live stream because you don't have a place to go. But you know what? Most of those people wish they had the opportunity to be where you are, in a group of people together, which is why I love this group so much because normally we get to a point where I have to throw you out because <laughs> you do stay to the end. But there are some, and I wonder, where are you going? And I'm not saying it about anybody here in particular. This is for the stream. This is for the teaching. My point is, why is it that you still prefer anything but being with each other? Why, where, why is there any place you'd rather be? Well, because so-and-so rubs me the wrong way. Well, but you rub some people the wrong way too. So what? Get over it. Let's, let's learn how to do this. Okay? Let's learn how to do this. So I'm hoping now that as we go through this process, we become more Chag-centric. We start focusing on the feast. We understand historically and future-wise what's going on. But most importantly, we're looking at our process that we're walking this through. By the way, you're going to get this all in Christmas and Easter? No. But you walk out the Moedim and you get to see every step of his plan. It's open. It's transparent. It's there. I don't think I'm giving some very bizarre, unique insights. You can see in what's going on through that plan how it matches up with what we're doing and what we go through. So you can see that process. Amen? I mean, let's go to the Father. Avina Malkinu, our Father, our King. Father, we, we're just so blessed. I mean, just really blessed that you have given us the plan of salvation through your feasts. That you have given us these times where we can be refreshed, we can have rest, we can come and meet with you, and we can also start to learn to fall in love with each other and learn how to be a body and not just individuals. That we can come, becoming a, come together becoming a nation. So, Father, we just want to thank you so much for your foresight and your love and your compassion and your mercy to know how much we would need these days and these things so that it would help us to become the people you desire us to be, both individually and as, as a group. And so, Father, we just want to thank you and thank you and thank you. Sing praises to your holy name for the feasts and for the times that we meet with you, for the Moedim, for the Shalosh Regalim, for the Mikra, Mikra Kodeshim that are connected, the set-apart gatherings to all of these feasts, the high days, and most of all, for every week, our Shabbat. The Shabbat that you give us, that keeps us, and keeps, gives us that connecting point to you every single week. So, Father, we thank you. And we ask that you would help us now, as we are in that period between Shavuot and Trumpets, help us to take what you're trying to teach us and take that information, start to embrace it in our walk, discard the old man habits and the old man thinking processes and behaviors, and to start to put on the renewed man so that when we get to Trumpets, when we get to Yom Teruah, when we get to Rosh Hashanah, we are ready to truly hear and shema your voice. So, Father, we thank you. We thank you for all these things and praise your name and give glory and honor to you in the name above all names, Yeshua, our Messiah. Amen. Amen.